Good. Well, good morning, uh, everybody. I hope everybody had a good rest, because I think we're, we have an energetic day ahead of us, and we're, you're going to need your energy uh, for that. Um, we have a very short session to start, then we get into our, our keynote uh, speeches and the agenda for the, the day. So I wanted to just maybe start by making a few comments to, to frame uh, some of the discussion today and some of the things that we want to make sure that you're thinking about as we go through the day. Um, later on, we'll have a session that will talk about the program for the Sun Business Network. And one of the key documents that we need to finalize here is this uh, Sun Network Strategic and Operational Plan, which I hope people have uh, got uh, outside. There's some on extra copies on this table up here in the front. But it's important that we really get feedback on this document. I mean, especially uh, we want to hear about some of the principles for engagement. The plan is to share this document with the other uh, Sun networks to get their input as well. But there is a key uh, deliverable to um, give this to the Sun lead group in January. So there's not a lot of time to finalize this and there's quite a number of issues uh, that are embedded in this document and there's been a, you'll hear a bit later about the whole process that has gone into to preparing it. But I think just to reiterate, the plan for this network is really to keep it fairly light, but really focused on facilitating and mobilizing uh, commitments from uh, the private sector to, and, uh, and others to work in partnership to support the Sun process. Last night, we, um, we heard strong statements by all the speakers about how important it is for business to be involved uh, in the Sun process. There was a, a strong uh, presentation from David uh, that this needs to be done in a way that where business is according to the highest uh, ethical standards and transparency but then that we really have a job to do to get business to, to do this. I think what he was really referring to and is the mistrust and, some, and the misunderstandings that we often have between the public and private sector and that this is a real barrier that we're going to need to overcome if this network is to get off the ground. And many of you know what that, that narrative of mistrust looks like with the, you know, the, the uh, private sector often saying that government is just looking for a, a handout and the, and, the, and the public sector and civil society often saying that you know the private sector really only wants to get involved in these things to uh, clean its reputation, uh, get more profits or, or flog um, products that are inappropriate. So you know those are the real perceptions that are out there. Um, and quite vocally, and so we, we really do need to make sure that we are addressing this as we go forward, because we don't address it here, it's just going to sit out there. Um, and I guess, you know, the, we do also have to address one of the elephants in the room here, uh, which is that, you know, most of the, uh, a lot of the big food and beverage companies uh, who are major players uh, in the marketplace, uh, but who violate the code on the marketing of breast milk substitutes, you know, have not been invited to participate and are not here because uh, of the because they violate the code. Uh, however, they are major players in the in the uh, in nutrition. Uh, they are included by national governments in national processes around nutrition. And so, you know, we, we do need to be, get some clarity how we are going to deal with this issue and how we deal with these, uh, these uh, players because uh, they are conspicuous by their absence, but there are, you know, the code is a very important document and, and it 
you know, we do need to follow, follow the, the rules about that. But, you know, so I, I just want to make sure that people are aware this is an elephant in the room and, and let's just not pretend it's not there. I mean, we need, a, we need ways of, of addressing that. The other big challenge, I think, as we go forward is that I think there's a perception out there that, um, that the private sector is just dying to get into this process and, and play a major role in the business network and in the sun. And, um, and I think the reality is that, uh, and I really need to make this clear, is that we are really struggling to get the private sector engaged in this process. I mean, we have some of the committed companies who've been long committed before the sun had came along and they're here. Uh, and that's one thing. But I think for both the Olympic Hunger Summit, which gained uh, at Downing Street, which gained coordinated the private sector component, and for this meeting, it has really been a real challenge to get business engaged in the process. And I think just to remind people, you know, we, the sun won't succeed with, and it said yesterday, without real business engagement. Not only because the private sector brings a whole number of expertise and innovation to R&D, to marketing, but, you know, we get to the investment gap that we have, the roughly 10 billion plus dollars that we need a year, and the less than uh, a little over half a billion dollars, half a, uh, yeah, half a billion dollars that we have right now from bilateral donor funding. So, you know, it, it's, it's not only um, uh, critical, but it's essential if the sun is to get anywhere that we need real investment in a lot of the, the uh, strategies that we're proposing. Uh, the other big question is, you know, is not only is how do we bring the sun at in uh, the business into the sun at different levels? So there's clearly a global level discussion, and this and I think a meeting like this is is really grappling with who are some of those global stakeholders and how do we engage them and how do we bring them in? But there is also another side, and I think. Um, Part of the answer to how we engage business uh, is really going to be addressed at the country level. And last night at, at the dinner, we heard representatives from Nigeria and Tanzania uh, appeal to us to, to go local. And I think this is a huge opportunity for us. We'll hear later uh, from Chris about the first uh, Sun National Consultation with Business in Nigeria which the Lagos Business School convened last week. There are plans and there's some, some limited resources from, from some of our donors to support a range of consultations in, uh, and, there, in, and there are some plans in countries like Kenya, Mozambique and, and Indonesia to do this. But we can do this in, in a number of countries as part of uh, engaging business at the national level. So this would really allow us to, to build this from the ground up as well as thinking of what we can do from the global level. And, and I think if we want to ensure that, that business is aligned with the objectives of government and those, those strategies that being are, are developed on the ground, it's going to be absolutely critical that we invest quite heavily in the mobilization in, in those priority countries. This would also, I think, help us a lot with the principles of accountability that I think we are inevitably going to struggle a bit with because here then we would be ensuring that a lot of the accountability of business would rest with government, national governments, which um, not, who coordinate sun activities but also are the ones responsible for the legal and regulatory environments nationally. So there's a lot of logic, I think, into pushing this down to the, the, the national level. So we are going to have to think through the business network as something that is, is trying to move something at the global level and something much more heavily at the national level. We also need to be fairly flexible because some of the, uh, some of the value chains that we want to engage with are not just tightly into countries. They, some of them work sub-regionally 
And so we'll have to be a bit creative. And we also need to be creative that we're not just talking to the food and beverage industry they, or the ingredients industry, which are absolutely fundamental. And I think they need to be at the core of what we are doing. But there are a lot of other sectors. We have some banking here, but we don't have a lot of uh, information communication technology sectors here, insurance players we don't have. We can go through transport. There's a lot of players who, who aren't here who do play a key role. So let's think creatively how we uh, really mobilize some of these uh, other players. So we have an exciting program for the rest of the day. Um, we really have set it up to maximize uh, participation. So we really do want to get your views. And throughout each of the sessions, we do have note takers who are going to be trying to tease out the key points. And at the end of the day, we'll be summarizing that as part of the, the closing. So um, with that, let me uh, stop and, and turn over to Jim Harvey from WFP. Jim, over to you. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Can I just do a microphone check? Is this thing working OK? I had to scratch my ear just now, so I have no idea quite if it's in the right place. <laughs> OK. Good morning, everyone. And um, congratulations, Mark, and all other colleagues on, on the occasion of this important launch. Uh, I was so impressed last night uh, listening to the speakers how none of them had any notes. Regrettably, I've got some. So f uh, allow me to, to, to at least refer to them partly as we go, we go through the, the conversation this morning. I'd like to start by bringing you the, the, the greetings from Eartha and Cousin, who is our executive director uh, at the UN World Food Program, uh, and she's the representative of the UN system to the Sun Movement Lead Group. Um, Eartha is passionate about this movement, and I know she wanted to be here today. Unfortunately, WFP is famous for its logistics, but we haven't found a way yet of getting Eartha in two places at once. At this very moment, she's flying back from a trip in the Middle East where she has been talking to a range of countries about how they will, should be supporting the organization. And of course, that's one of the changes in the world that we're experiencing now. Um, organizations like WFP, we're now talking to a much wider range of partners all around uh, than we ever were before. Um, so in spite of having a strong logistics element in WFP, we couldn't get her in two places at once. But I'm very pleased to be here to convey WFP's support and enthusiasm for the Sun Business Network launch. Just before going into this, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with WFP. Uh, we're a un United Nations uh, agency. We employ about 14,000 people worldwide. We're the world's largest humanitarian agency, and most of what we do is humanitarian response. When you look at uh, the television and you see um, the white Toyotas driving through the rubble with the, the antenna on the front and, and the blue circle on the door, there's a good chance it's a WFP car. When you see a photograph of an airdrop over South Sudan and there's an airplane there and it's dipping up and, and we're dropping food into unreachable parts, that's uh, the, the UN Humanitarian Air Service and it's run by WFP. So we do a lot of that sort of stuff, but we also do a lot of other work which is connected to the agenda here today. Uh, we have a lot of nutritional work. We, we, I think we're probably the largest supporter of, of school feeding globally. Is that right, Martin? And we do a lot of work with mother and child nutrition in, in other contexts. So it's humanitarian primarily, and it's the rough end of the spectrum of, of operations, but a little bit more than that as well. Um, I, I focus on this, this, this kind of logistics thing here because some of the comments in, in, in my notes here um, are written, obviously, by colleagues who have a, a logistical frame of mind. So have, keep in mind when I'm talking here about that Toyota Land Cruiser. It's a four-wheel drive vehicle, and it's going over some very bumpy territory. So when I start to talk about numbers of wheels in a movement, uh, that's the analogy it's alluding to. And I think it, it comes naturally from WFP because of the sort of work we do. This event has been two years in the making, and it's a critical milestone in the expansion of this rapidly evolving multi-stakeholder Sun movement. Um, the milestone analogy is only partially apt as well, because Sun is all about a movement. We're interested in the road ahead, not the distance traveled. 
more than a milestone, this meeting is, is a pit stop on the urgent race against hunger and malnutrition. Specifically, we are here to mount the fourth wheel on this vehicle called Scaling Up Nutrition. Until today, Sun has officially rolled on three wheels, the Civil Society Organization Network, the Donor Network, and the United Nations Network. And of course, there is actually a fifth wheel in all of this, which is the steering wheel, which is held firmly by the Sun countries themselves. And as we heard last night, Sun is now working with the governments of 33 countries to scale up nutrition in line with national policies and strategies. Now, thanks to all of you, we will roll on four wheels, giving more traction for Sun countries racing towards our goal, safe and adequate nutrition for mothers and young children and for all people everywhere. Each of the Sun networks pushes forward, and yet we may not always agree which turns are best in the short term. Mark, you were talking about, you were alluding to some of this now. So we may have different opinions, but this movement, in this movement, none of us are entitled to our own facts. This is why our discussions must be evidence-based. We live in a world now where we have access to more evidence about what works and what doesn't work than ever before. Non-governmental and civil society organizations, in particular, perform knowledge, advocacy, and watchdog roles and add vital detail to our roadmaps. Are there any, I don't know if civil society is represented here today, is it, Mark? Are we have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To you, I'll yeah. say you help ensure <laughs> that we, that is the public sector and the private sector, you help ensure that we keep moving forward and that this country-led movement maintains the clearest possible vision as we progress towards our agreed destination. And none of us should forget who actually is driving this vehicle, the Sun countries who have reached out for our partnership and support. We need to hold ourselves accountable over time for the commitments we make to grow and sustain this movement. Constructive criticism is essential. If we don't get things on the table, we can't solve them. I think, Mark, you were also alluding to that. So let's talk about elephants. I mean, they're, they're usually pretty visible, and I think we're in a spirit now of dialogue between all, all the different partners who are involved in this to actually get beyond some of the positions that we've been stuck in before. We depend on one another to objectively assess our respective contributions and scale up performance in the bright light of peer-reviewed knowledge and evidence. And I've observed over the last 10 years, the, 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 the evidence about nutrition has been, it's still, I think, very inadequate, but it's actually getting stronger by the day. We have much better idea now of what we need to be doing. Sun is a young movement, but WFP's collaboration with uh, GAIN goes back a full decade. Um, it was reinforced last year when our two organizations signed an agreement linking WFP's mandate for fighting hunger worldwide with GAIN's strength in fostering public-private partnerships. So I'm delighted to share this kickoff session with you, Mark, and your colleagues. And um, in fact, tomorrow, I don't know whether you knew this, but the, you're going to be on the same plane as our ED, Ertherin Cousin, going out to Rome, and we're all going to meet in Rome again tomorrow afternoon. Uh, she's routing through London. I don't know whether you knew yeah. that, but you'll be, on, you'll, you'll be able to talk to her on the plane. Um, and we'll share the outcomes of today's launch with, with her. Um, and we all expect from that that this will bring new and stronger public-private partnerships in service of this country-led movement. So, so what do public and private offer one another? The private sector, as we see it, holds key expertise and economies of scale for optimizing production to reduce costs and limit waste. It holds professionally designed control systems to ensure product quality and safety. And it is delivering an ever-inspiring stream of new products and technical innovations. The public sector, including governments, agencies like WFP, our sister agencies, UNICEF, Food and Agriculture Organization, has tested experience with diversified distribution systems for reaching the people most in need of assistance for better nutrition. 
Now, that's what it says in my speech notes, but I was thinking of what Paul Pullman was saying last night. Nine out of ten people in the world basically interact, are part of, or with the public, the private sector. WFP is a big organization. We reach about between 90, maximum 110 million people every year. And reaching can be anything from providing a full year's ration to someone who's stuck in a, in a, in a, in a refugee camp uh, on the border of some country where they can't go back because of violence and fighting, to a very short intervention, perhaps after a natural disaster, an earthquake, for example, in Haiti at the moment, where the intervention might be not quite small. But anyway, that's the sort of order of magnitude that we are talking about. Paul mentioned the billion people who go to, hungry, go to bed hungry every night. In fact, when uh, our sister organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, recast the figures uh, with a, a, an improved methodology earlier this year, um, the figure is actually now stands is good news. It's 870 million. Is that the right figure, Martin? Yeah. 870. That's not actually an improvement, it's, it's a better methodology, but whatever. <laughs> so that, I may, that's, that's really important to know, but it's still a huge figure. And beyond that, at least as many people again, probably up to two billion, whose, whose diets are just not enough to allow them to live a decent life. And we are touching 90 to 110 million of those. It's very, very few. So other parts of the public sector also are reaching out to these people. But as we heard, Jay, where are, you, where are you, Jay? You were talking about India and the Dalits last night. There are huge se segments of the population where actually the public sector isn't delivering much either. So we've got a huge task ahead of us and quite limited windows of how to reach them. But the private sector, although my notes talk about the public sector as having the reach, actually I think it's the private sector that potentially has the reach, potentially because of all the issues that we've talked about. And I think that the solution to better nutrition for the vast majority of the world's poor people has to be driven and led by the private sector because the public sector can only do so much. We can do a lot, but we can only do so much. WFP itself is a steadfast believer in public-private partnership because we have witnessed its benefits firsthand through our successful joint efforts with, with many companies and private foundations. Um, in September this year, uh, Arthur and Cousin uh, delivered a keynote speech at DSM's event uh, celebrating 100 years of vitamins. That's why I knew the answer last night, but I kept quiet <laughs> when our colleague from DSM asked the question. DSM's global contribution in developing manufacturing processes to aff affordably mass-produce micronutrients is, ma is well known to many people in this room. Our partnership with DSM enables us to integrate in innovations like inexpensive micronutrient powders and fortified foods into WFP programs. Because basically, historically, we deal in bulk. You know, we, deal, we deal in a sort of a pretty basic ration, largely composed of grains and pulses, a bit of oil, a bit of sugar. With these micronutrient supplements, we can really get our rations to poor people living in terrible conditions up to nutrition standard. Together, we're working to extend the shelf life of supplemental nutritional products. These are the products that are so important in the first thousand days, the supplementary feeds that make sure that, that actually make the difference between kids who are going to have a lousy start in life and those who can make it through. DSM volunteers have deployed alongside our humanitarian workers, contributing their expertise and helping governments to develop stronger nutrition strategies. I don't want to focus only on DSM here because we have partnerships with many in the private sector and, and quite a few of you in, in this room here. WFP takes its public-private partnerships very seriously. We have recently realigned our organizational structure to bring government partnerships and and private partnerships within one uh, major uh, command, senior management command. We've just appointed a new private sector director whose name is Jay Aldous. He started work yesterday, and when I get back to Rome tomorrow, I'm going to give him a list of business cards, which, uh, or I'm going to give him the all the business cards I get from you today, so please give them to me during the, the course of the day and ask him to get in touch with you. And we're, we're going to produce a new private sector strategy, strategy for our executive board by the middle of next year. 
In the face of global challenges, we need to ensure that our hunger fighting mission is sustained by innovation and resources, and that's what this is all about. WFP has a duty to explore partnerships wherever we find partners who are eager to help, but we do have to keep our eyes open on the road ahead, including driving through the bush and watching out for the odd elephant. Um, the United Nations General Principles, which were published in 2009 for working in partnership with business, include advance UN goals. Well, in that case, it's our mission statement about reaching the, the world's most poorest and most vulnerable hungry people. Um, have shared values and principles, have a clear delineation of responsibilities and roles, maintain integrity and independence, provide no unfair advantage, and maintain transparency. And then laid on that, Mark, you were talking about the sun principles and the code and so on and so forth. So we actually have a very good basis to have a discussion here. Uh, WFP and other UN agencies understand that public-private partnerships present huge opportunities, but also some risks and challenges. There are the usual ones that all our programs face, the security and health risks to our staff and those of cooperating partners in tough, rough, dangerous places. The challenge of reaching those most in need. It's always very difficult to get to the bottom of the pyramid. It might be easier actually for the private sector with a product than it sometimes is with a targeted intervention. And perhaps most importantly, the risks to, to hungry and malnourished people Firstly, if our programs actually fail to reach them, or if they create dependency rather than building resilience to future shocks. In the, in the aid development world now, and I'm sure it's the same in business, resilience is, is, is one of the, the buzzwords which is coming along now. So we're looking at the resilience of our organization, but we're also looking to see how we can build the resilience of people, because we all want to see an end to aid dependency at least. And if you look how the world is going now, there is a view out there that, that conventional public sector aid may even have peaked. So another reason now, as the world's economy shifts around and the centers of gravity move in it, different players come on the scene, middle-income countries come to the fore, new players, changes with in, in relationships between public and private sector. Um, there's, there's a different future out there in which conventional aid may actually be producing, uh, sort of playing a slightly lower role. For partnerships of all kinds, including public-private ones, there is a risk that a partnership fails to meet the expectations of the partners. In the worst case, that the partnership binds together organizations with essentially conflicting objectives and interests. I think you all know this because I'm sure you do it all the time in your, your partnerships amongst um, um, private sector bodies. For, from the WFP point of view, to mitigate those kinds of risks, we apply rigorous due diligence uh, to ensure partnerships we enter into bring benefits for all parties, and most importantly, that they act in the long-term interest of the hungry poor, who are the end consumers of our services. So as partners, we need to stay open-eyed and alert about opportunities and challenges both. We're all used, used to our own ways of communicating, but being a movement, which is what Sun is, it's a movement, means learning to reach beyond familiar circles, overcoming cultural differences to achieve common goals. We at WFB say with conviction that while working together is a challenge, it also offers unparalleled opportunities. It opens the road for each partner to benefit from the other's strengths, understand the complete landscape, and create win-win solutions for everyone. Thank you very much, Mark. It's a privilege to be here Thank this you. morning. And thanks to all of you for listening. And let's have a great meeting this morning. Thank you.